You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. My guest is a Professor Christopher Bader. He's a professor and chair of sociology part of the Department of Sociology at Chapman University. He's affiliated with the Institute for Religion, Economics, and Society, IRES. He's co-director of the annual Chapman University Survey of American Fears. He's also associate director of the Association of Religion Data Archives, the ARDA, T-H-E-A-R-D-A.com. It's the world's largest archive of religion survey data funded by the Templeton Foundation and the Lilly Foundation. So welcome, Chris. Thanks for coming. Well, thanks for having me. If you would, uh, tell me a bit about your background and how you got to study the like data on the things you're collecting on. Sure. Well, I've been a sociologist for, for years. And when I started studying religion, I started to really notice, as this is not controversial, most religion scholars have noticed this, is a decline in conventional religion. People, uh, when you ask them what they are, are you a Catholic or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran, they will say nothing. And that increase really interested me, and I, I started looking into those folks and seeing that they were um, not turning into atheists, they were turning into something else. And a lot of them had an interest in so-called paranormal subjects, things like UFOs and ghosts and Bigfoot. So that led me to an interest in those subjects that I've had for a couple of decades now and written pretty extensively on them. Yeah, through the ARDA and through IRES, um, what kind of surveys have you been doing and what kind of information are you looking to get? Yeah, sure. At the ARDA, that project, we collect survey data that anybody has done that they're willing to share with us related to religion. If, if someone has asked any question related to religion, we're interested in their data. So the ARDA is sort of a, a, a warehouse, a storehouse of all of those data because we're trying to preserve it so that scholars over time can look back and understand how religion has been asked about, understand trends in religion over time. The work I do myself, it does tend to relate to two areas specifically these days. One, that I do a survey Americans regularly, just surveyed Brit about their beliefs and uh, reported experiences with paranormal topics or subject. And I also have a real interest in um, examining people's fears. And that led to um, the formation of the Chapman University Survey of American Fears now nine years why fears and what uh, kind of data have you gathered there what insight sure well why fear is that over time i noticed and i want to be clear this is not a unique insight on my part i partially noticed because of what other scholars were saying that fear was a huge driver in a lot of social phenomena fear fear is something that drives voting fear is something that politicians know they can use to drive votes fear is something that drives policies about crime and immigration drives policies about how the government's going to spend its money that fear has a lot of power but it's also something that is very understudied that when i looked at became interested in fear and tried to look at the landscape out there of who's been collecting data on this how can we see how fears were changing over time that data simply was not there nobody was looking at that fear consistently and regularly over time uh, to give you an example uh, every halloween there's going to be a lot of surveys uh, one or two question surveys that media companies will call people about where they ask them how afraid they are of ghosts if there is some sort of event whether it's a natural disaster a major crime a terrorist event you will see a lot of surveys in the immediate aftermath of those events where where samples of the american public are asked how afraid are they of, of murderers or or criminals or terrorists etc but nobody's tracking that over time and that's that's what we're trying to do with the survey of american fears is for the last nine years, this will be the 10th wave of the survey coming up. We ask the same set of items. We also add different items so we can explore the relationships. But for the last nine years, we have been asking about the same 80 plus fears. So we can, and we make the data entirely public. It's all available at the ARDA, all available on Chapman's website and other places because we want to encourage the study of fear and its effects on society. Well, what do you notice about it? What's changed or what fears, you know, are the fears echoed by what the media tells people to be afraid of? You know, are the politicians well, or the fears seem to be coming from somewhere else? That's, um, you're going to hate this answer, but it's a little bit of everything. But uh, because uh, what we've noticed is by, by being able to do this over time, we notice both phenomena going on where we always rank our fears by the percentage of people 
who say that they are afraid or very afraid of things. For example, Americans have been, of all the things we ask about, we ask about everything from being murdered to getting sick, someone you love getting sick, running out of money, to things that you might call phobias, like uh, being afraid of clowns or needles or heights. Over time, we've noticed that some things consistently show up at the top of the list. Other things are certainly affected by current events that we always see at the top. Literally, we always see at the top of our list. It's always there is the number one fear of Americans is the fear of corrupt government officials that more than two thirds of Americans in the most recent that that's what they're most afraid of, corrupt government officials. And that's always at or near the top. Any way too late for that. Well, and it's also, I think, part of the reason that that number is so high is with the with the way that we've become so fragmented in terms of our politics and our media. That's a question that everyone can agree with. Right? That um, progressives think that conservatives are corrupt. Conservatives think progressives are corrupt, et cetera. That um, that this is something where we're not asking specifically. Do you think conservative people are corrupt? Do you think liberal people are corrupt? What we're finding is sort of a, a uniform belief amongst Americans that just all government is is corrupt. That is a very strongly held belief, and that does not change based on who's in power. That when Democrats are in power, we think everyone's government's corrupt. When Republicans are in power, we think the government is corrupt. I mean, American. And other things that are sort of, if you can imagine, the biggest disasters that might happen to you personally are always near the top of the list. Someone I love dying, dying myself, running out of money, someone I love becoming seriously ill. Those are always near the top of the list and are resistant to current events. So these are sort of the perennial things that Americans worry about, the government, health, and money. But then, depending on current events, other things will show up and drop out. Um, And uh, for example, what we were seeing in 2016, 2017, sort of the beginning of the Trump era, when at that time, there was a lot of discussion about getting the EPA, that that was sort of in the, at the time that the survey was administered, that was really in the public, public domain and the public discussion. And at that time, we started to see a lot of fears about pollution and unsafe drinking water rise to the top of the list. Since that time, they've they've dropped down. They're still high, but they're not not top 10. So that's a very long answer to your question. There are certain things that are sort of perennial, certain things that will show up near the top, depending on what was going on when the survey was administered. So what do you do with this information? Is it more just for the public, their consumption? Um, you put out papers based on what you see, like what's the, what do you see as the real utility of doing this? Sure. First of all, it, it does impact my own research. I have written a book along with my colleague called Fear Itself. I've uh, written several articles related to fear. And I'm always interested in, I'm not as interested in just simply documenting the the fears themselves. I'm interested in trying to document what uh, what seems to predict those fears or what are the outcomes of those. So I've done research where I've looked at the effect of religion on fear or the relationship between religion and fear. I've done research on the fear of crime and the likelihood that you will engage with your community, depending on how afraid you are of crime. What we see really as the key benefit of this project is, again, we make the data entirely public, that we want to encourage academics to study fear in ways that we can't even anticipate, because we think that, frankly, we think that fear is hurting society that fear is something that can lead to a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies. And so in our view, we feel like this is a phenomenon that needs to be better studied. And it will be better studied if we can provide data over time. Okay. But is it changing at all? More of the fears just seem to, you know, this one's predominant, now that one's predominant. But, you know, again, the core fears, they just never seem to change. As I mentioned, those core fears where we're talking about your death, the death of loved ones, your finances, and fear of government, those are just always showing up near the top and others wax and wane that every year go to if you just if anyone who's listening to the podcast simply searches for chapman survey of american fears the first link they will come to in most search engines is they will come to the the official site for the survey where they can look at a list of all of the fears we asked about and what percentage of americans are afraid of those things and they'll see that and they can look at at years going back and see how those things are changing what about doing it for uh, different countries to see what the difference is or amidst the respondents do you have data on them like how many are women how many are men ages yeah, absolutely that that and that to me again is um what's most interesting to me is not simply being able to say six percent of americans are afraid of clowns that was true in 2021 by the way but it's to be able to see what are the patterns what are the predictors so yes in addition to asking people what they're afraid of we gather data on their their gender their income their education the region of the country they live in 
um, their religious background and religious practice. How, how often are they attending religious services if they do it all? We ask them their job status, how many children they have. So we do and look at and do analyses where we look at which fears vary by gender, which fears do people who have a lot of money fear things more or less or certain things more or less than people who have less money? Those are all analyses that, that we can do. Someone else who downloads the data can do the same. But have you done them or you're you're just taking to the, the basic skews of the data? Well, I do what are called multivariate analyses where I'm generally doing an analysis where all of those predictors are in a model along with what I'm trying to predict. So I don't generally look at myself, simply look at, well, what do women fear more than men? I am looking at what we call controlling for gender, controlling for income, controlling for education, and more sophisticated models that I'm doing. What's your goal with all this? Is it just a public good, or is there some other endpoint you're looking at? Well, I guess I will talk about what my realistic goals are and what my pie in the sky goals are. I have an interest in this as a researcher. So one of my goals is for myself to, I'm going to be researching this topic as my career moves forward, writing further papers, writing further books about the topic. So I have a personal interest in this. But my hope is, my pie in the sky hope is that as we talk about fears, we talk about some of the things that we've found related to fear, that we might help people be less fearful, that we might help people understand their fears better and therefore be less likely to reflexively be afraid of other people or people that are not like them or less easy, easily manipulated. So, I mean, uh, besides just having the survey data out there, how, how do you imagine that it would help people? Do they read it and then take some action? Is there a guide or recommendations you could make because you've been gathering this data for so long? Maybe your own personal experience, like how has it changed that? You know, how do you relate to fear nowadays that you less afraid or seeing this data that make me even fear even worse? Well, let me let me answer the first question first is that do we have sort of a, a guide? And there's in the academic articles that I write, the articles that go in, in journals, those are generally focused on a very specific issue and geared towards an academic audience. But it is important to us that we do this. We write press releases and our book, Fear Itself, was written for it with a general audience in mind. And in fact, the book does end with a series of suggestions for helping to mitigate your fear and how you can handle it when you're afraid of something. So it is a goal of ours, to the extent that we can do it, to try to give people tools to help them manage their fear. That is not something that we see as the totality of our mission. It's not something we see as a mission we can accomplish. This is something that we hope that if we're doing a little bit and if other academics become interested in, in fear, they might be able to do a little bit and maybe we can have some sort of small impact. Okay. How has it uh, influenced your own thoughts and fears? Do you fear less or you know what's changed with you? I wouldn't say that the survey has changed my own fears. It was partially my understanding of the nature of fear and some of the patterns that we see that led me to help, you know, help develop the survey in the first place. Uh, certainly, I've learned a lot about what Americans fear, but in terms of learning about something, learning something about myself and my own fears, I wouldn't say that, that it has done anything there for me. Oh, really? Oh, it hasn't made your fears less or anything? I mean, looking at these and, you know, maybe that's a comfort. Oh, uh, you know, there's a, a big set of core fears that everyone has. Maybe that thing makes you feel better if you have them. You know? I think it does help people feel better. I've talked to people who have contacted me, just emailed me out of the blue and says it does make them feel better to see that they are not alone in a particular fear. But yeah, again, in, in terms of uh, myself, it's not, I've taken the survey many times. Obviously, we're testing it all the time, but uh, simply seeing the survey is not, and seeing the results of a, of a sample of Americans hasn't changed much. Okay. What advice would you give for someone that's a, you know, a typical person that maybe, they're, you know, they're anxious all the time or they're afraid of a lot of things? Like, what you know, how would you counsel them if they ask for your help? Sure. Now, obviously, that would vary a lot depending on the type of fear we're talking about. But, but I can say that some general things I tell people is that a lot of our fear comes from the media we consume whether that is doom scrolling on your phone or turning on the news. And the number one thing that I find that people are very unaware of, and it helps them when they understand this, is they need to know that the thing that they are seeing in the news is the rarest thing that's happened. That's why it's new. That when they see a story in the news, and we know this from a lot of interviews of people, when people see a story in the news about a serial killer, it tends to lead them to conclude that there's lots of serial killers. In fact, the number of serial killings have been going precipitously down over time. But Americans have literally a flipped view of what are the most common crimes and what are the least common crimes. Yes, if you ask a random sample of Americans, and we've done this before on the fear survey, serial killings been going up or down over time. The vast majority of Americans will be saying they've been going up. If you ask Americans, well, if, uh, the stranger abduction of children has been going up or down over time, then the vast majority of Americans will be saying going up. And they are directly, they're just wrong. 
that those things have been going precipitously down over time. That um, as police agencies, as law enforcement, as the FBI have gotten better at crossing, at tracking crimes across jurisdictions, the capture of serial killers tends to happen more quickly, and there have been fewer active serial killers over time. The most common way you're going to be killed, frankly, is the most common murder is when two men get into a fight over something and the killing happens because there was ready access to a weapon or someone just hit someone and uh, they fell and, and had a traumatic injury. That right. uh, The most typical crime is between people who know each other, know each other and have gotten into an argument about something. But what we're afraid of is we're afraid of the stranger in a van driving down the street. And not that I'm telling people not to be wary if there's a stranger in a van driving down your street. But what I'm saying is when you let rare crimes influence you too much because you have a mistaken sense that they are growing, that might lead you to stay away from public places like park. It might lead you to hide in your house and not get to know your neighbors. Uh, get what All of those things tend to make crime go up. When people avoid public bases, they stay away from the parks. What happens is like a vacuum, those parks will actually draw in a criminal element. When people don't get to know their neighbors, that makes it more likely that a crime can occur in the neighborhood and not be reported. So sometimes our reactions to fear actually make us less safe. So one of the big tips I would give to people is when you see something on the news, just remember you're seeing it because it is rare. It's fine to be, you know, obviously it, that doesn't make the crime any less or event any less shocking or horrifying. Just also draw the conclusion this is happening more than, than I used to. Because the other thing that happens in the media that I try to warn people about is when there's one serial killing that often lead the media to search for other. In other words, now that we have one serial killing, now that there's been this one odd crime, the media will search for other. And when all of a sudden we start to see more than one cases to conclude, oh no, this is rising. When all it means is somebody searched really hard and found all the cases. I don't know if you remember this, but a few years back we had an epidemic. I wish you could see me use air quotes here. Well, that, that must have shown something in the data. What did it show? Well, no, this is not about the data. Just I was giving you an example about a few years back, there was an epidemic of fear about bath salts zombies. I don't know if you heard about this. I remember eating people's faces off and all that. Yeah. Well, yes. literally you had one story and then you had a bunch. And the way both the media and the average citizen was reading that was now we have an epidemic of bath salt zombies. Now, what really happened is everybody just searched really hard and found all of the very small number of cases that seemed similar at all. And in fact, most of those cases didn't involve bath salts at all. We're on some other drug or we're mentally ill. So just to be aware that when we see something, we're likely seeing it because it's rare. And also the fact that it's rare and shocking is why it got our attention in the first place. If we start to see more stories about that, that doesn't mean this phenomenon is actually rising and you're in more danger. It actually means the media might have found all those people. All for sure. Okay. That makes sense. What about uh, COVID? Did you collect data through there? And what, you know, so I'm sure that I would guess that would be that changed people's fear profile. Like, what did it do? Sure. Um, during the COVID years, there was obviously a spike, a great spike in questions about your personal health and illness. And, and we saw that at that point, fear of someone you love dying, fear, you know, fears about your own personal health and also the income fear. Because a lot of people obviously were feeling very insecure in their income during COVID. Those really grew dramatically during that time. Okay. Any other weird things that came out? So it amplified some of the core fears, but yeah. of COVID itself, did you ask about that? Or a lot of people afraid? We did. I'd have to look up those numbers. I can do that if you want. But we, you know, that was several years ago. We did ask a battery of questions about COVID skepticism. Were people going to get the vaccine? But I don't have those numbers in front of me. What about, you know, the younger generation, uh, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, or especially Gen Z, you know, people are saying they're like incredibly anxious and depressed and all this other stuff. Do you have any corroborating data? Or do you not, uh, does fear not really tie into that at all? There are definitely, well, first of all, you should know that we survey adults, so we're, we're going to get 18 and above. So we're never going to know anything about what adolescents fear, what teens who are below 18 fear. But um, we do definitely find that there, there's nothing that's particularly surprising there. As people get older, they tend to have more fears about their health, more fears about a loved one dying. As younger people are more likely to feel insecure about their income than, than people who are more middle years and later years. So we do see some age effects, but I wouldn't say that I'm seeing some huge Gen Z effect or we haven't run analyses to see if younger people show a greater number of opportunities. 
Have you surveyed people that have been through a very traumatic event, like a, a serious illness or a near-death experience or, you know, some terrible financial problem, or like you know, an IRS audit or a divorce or a bankruptcy or a foreclosure? Now, the, the thing is, is that we are serving a random sample of Americans. So in our sample in any given year, there's going to be some people who likely have experienced some of those things. But we don't ask those questions of people, have you experienced an IRS audit? Have you had a member of your family murdered, uh, had you had a serious illness. We have not asked those questions. So they're in our sample, but we can't pick those people out. Well, it might be interesting, you know, if you don't ask maybe all the questions, but, you know, someone that survived a really traumatic experience, maybe they're less afraid now because, you know, they've faced really bad things and now everything else is not so bad. No, that, that actually is an interesting question. And that's one of the benefits of doing this um, year after year is that we can we can try new things and we'll do that over time. I think we would have to ask it in a more general way because if we asked about something very specific, have you experienced an IRS tax audit and five people in our sample have, that's not enough people to do an analysis. So we would have to be a little more general to be able to draw any conclusions. You know, you could say, have you experienced a significantly traumatic event? You know, it's up to you if you want to describe it, but if not, that's okay. But has it changed what you fear and, you know, what you value, that kind of thing? Might be yeah, interesting. No, that could definitely be an interesting reason. So you're trying to do a random sample, but do you know much about the cohort? Like their race, their ethnicity, their age, their gender, their blah, 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 blah. And are you seeing patterns or trends in any of that data? Or are you even allowed to look for patterns or trends on those levels? Yes. Everyone in the survey, we know their demographics. We know their race, ethnicity. We know their gender. We know their income. We know their education. We know their region of the country. So we, we can definitely, we know their political affiliation. We know a host of information about them. They are random they, and they are anonymous. So we don't know, know exactly where the person lives. We simply know that they live in the South, for example. We don't know their name. We just know that they got a college degree or went to high school. We know those things about these people so we can look at different patterns. Any interesting patterns that seem to correlate with where people live, how old they are, their gender, ethnicity, et cetera? I mean, like you gave some with, again, as people get older, you know, their fears change, but any other like really curious or interesting patterns you come across? There are definitely a lot of a lot of patterns that we see. I don't know if any of them I found particularly shocking. People, Republicans, for example, are more likely to have fears about immigration and more likely to have fears about the gun control. In other words, the government instituting stricter forms of gun control, that those tend to align along partisan lines. But no, I would not say that we've found anything hugely surprising about demographic patterns and what people fear. Okay. You know, we, we talked a lot about this data. Are there other uh, studies or types of data that you've been gathering and, and studying for a while that are very interesting, or is this your main thing? No, I also study paranormal belief and experience. Oh. So studying that and surveying Americans about that for quite a while. So oh, that's what, cool. I, what I mean by the paranormal is um, a ghost, UFOs, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, uh, th those types of subjects. Any interesting correlations there? Or like what, what does that data look like? You know, what are the common experiences people have or beliefs? Sure. I would say that some of the things that surprised us, I'll do have some co-authors on, on this project. Um, some of the things that surprised us were that uh, the ubiquity of paranormal belief, that over two thirds of Americans believe in something paranormal. Um, in other words, if you ask people, do you believe in Bigfoot? Do you believe in UFOs? Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe that some people have psychic powers? Two thirds of Americans will agree with at least one of those, if not more. It's very hard to tell if, if person A is going to believe in Bigfoot and person B is going to believe in ghosts. But what we do know is that Americans are very paranormal. They just tend to be what we call particularistic skeptics. They think that's, that the idea of ghosts are silly, but saw a UFO one. They can't believe anyone would believe in Bigfoot but think that sometimes they have deja vu or can have a psychic experience, that there's a lot of, you don't generally find um, amongst most Americans anyway, a complete dismissal of the paranormal. It's just uh, which particular thing do they believe in. Interesting. Are there any of the paranormal phenomena that people believe in most? Uh, people believe most in ghosts. That is by far, um, you have slightly over half of Americans believe in ghosts and that dwarfs everything else. You're down to about 25% when we're talking about believing that aliens are visiting Earth in modern times. Back, you're down much further to about 14% uh, when you're talking about Bigfoot. So uh, ghosts by far are the most ubiquitous paranormal. Uh, what about um, religious beliefs? You know, do you deal with, uh, you know, how many people believe in God and uh, particular religions? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the questions that interested us is how do so-called conventional religious beliefs relate to these paranormal beliefs? So we've done a lot of research where we're asking people both about what are they? You know, are they uh, are they a Catholic? Are they a Presbyterian? Are they a Muslim? Are they a Hindu? Or they, are they, do they say they're nothing? We ask them how often they attend religious services, how often they pray or meditate. And we can find out that these things are related to paranormal beliefs. Okay. Any interesting... You know, aspects of the data have paranormal beliefs changed over time or, you know, how many years have you been doing that for as many years as the, um, as the fears data and any different trends or same? Doing it longer than the fear, fear data. Um, what we're finding is just that these beliefs are, are definitely on the rise. It's not a precipitous rise or it's, it's a slow rise over time, but, um, back, uh, back about 10 years ago, it was about 45% of Americans that believed in ghosts. Now we're a little bit over 50. So these beliefs are slowly rising over time bigfoot has was used to be less than 14 percent. it used to be around eight or nine and now it's up to 14 so it's difficult to say whether these are going to be permanent trends because during the same period of time there's been an explosion in paranormal related tv shows and i think some of this belief and interest and if that uh, form of media ever starts to decline perhaps the belief will decline it's it's it will be difficult to say until a long time has passed what these beliefs are doing that's true. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Very interesting. Any other surveys that you're doing or looking to do that you think will be revealing? I am doing, currently finishing up research where I'm surveying paranormal beliefs amongst uh, the Brits, English, England, Wales, um, Scotland. And uh, that's something I'm very interested to see what we find, to see if we see similar patterns as we do in the States where these uh, beliefs are, are, are not similarly common seeing if it has similar patterns with religion. So very interested to see what comes with that, but too early to solve well. Is there any organization or person that's like a, a savant of, of surveys? They're amazing at it. You know, maybe, uh, maybe the most advanced is political surveys. I don't know. Maybe they're not. What, like who are the real uh, champions of the surveying world and the data gathering world that you've seen? I would say that um, the National Opinion Research Center or NORC is um, certainly a, a certainly at the forefront of survey research, as is the Pew Research Center. These are two um, organizations that collect like a lot of data, field a lot of different surveys, and obviously have developed enormous expertise on how to best construct survey questions and collect samples over time. Anything you could share? Like, what do they do that's so good? You know, are they just really good at getting truly randomized? As sample sets or like, what are they good at? Well, they're good at, um, I think what I would say the Pew Research Center and NORC are best at is understanding the natures of their samples. That what is the most, the most important thing about conducting a survey, or certainly one of the most important things is understanding what your sample consists of and not drawing incorrect conclusions based on your sample. It is just fine if your sample consists of only older people or only younger people or only people from the South. If you then don't draw inferences that uh, are about the entire U.S. population. NORC and the Pew Research Center have a great understanding of sampling. They have literally decades upon decades of experience constructing survey questions. They're an enormous tool simply to look and see their surveys over time. Why do we see, like, let's say with, uh, I mean, where do survey takers go wrong or data analysts? You know, uh, do they, their own beliefs uh, color the data? Or like, where do you see the problem occurs when people are trying to do this? Sure. Well, a lot of ways, unfortunately, the surveys can go wrong. The first one is what I mentioned is that uh, I see fairly often that people have done a non-random sample of people on the street and then tried to make a claim about what Americans think. Um, and that is, well, it's poor. That's poor analysis. That's poor inference from your from your data. That's the first thing is literally understanding who you're talking to and what your sample consists of and what its weaknesses and its strengths are. What, one thing that I say is there's not a bad sample. There's a bad inference from that sample. It is perfectly fine if you want to survey people that happen to wander across on the street. Just don't then claim that you know what Republicans think or what Democrats think or make some other similar broad inference. The other thing is that people have to be very careful when constructing their questions not to accidentally create the finding that they're looking for. Uh, there's a well-known practice where this is done purposefully in, in politics, so-called push-pull, where something as simple as when you're asking about abortion, if you ask someone, what is your opinion on abortion, and give them some response categories, you're going to get Hugely different responses than if you ask somebody, you don't agree with abortion, do you? Which is a real question that has appeared on the survey. Well, I, what I see happens is they'll be like, are you for or against? That's just, that cheats the issue. There's so many nuances to a lot of issues. 
not just that, you know, you, you can't channel someone's response to like either yes or no, because it's just a BS response. Or like on surveys, they're like one to five. Do you strongly agree? Somewhat agree? This just seems like garbage. I don't know. It just doesn't. Whenever I've done surveys, there's always things I want to put in there that the sample space doesn't allow for. And they don't ask, you know, very good questions. And the response mechanism seems to be garbage, too. So it's like, I know a lot of these surveys are just worthless, it seems like. Well, that's a strong statement. I wouldn't say that they are worthless. I would say that they are reductive. That's my end of one assessment. But yeah, they're reductive. That there's a lot of ways you could study someone. One way you could study someone and their attitudes is to spend a year with them, having long conversations and and interviews and transcribing those interviews and drawing conclusions from it. Another way is you could give them a survey where you ask them questions where they're where they are limited to strongly agree to strongly disagree. The first option is going to give you a heck of a lot more nuance. The second option is also going to give you quality information. It's just going to be more limited. Despite, I don't think that the surveys you're taking are garbage because I doubt no matter your nuance, you strongly agreed with something that you in fact strongly disagreed with. That I imagine what you did is you found a response that was closest to your nuance take on it. And that's what you chose. So that is telling us something. It's just not telling us the extreme nuance. And sometimes when we're talking about trying to get a sense of what 300 million Americans agree, you know, agree or disagree with or what they think about an issue, it's going to have to be somewhat reductive. Yeah, I just feel like like you're shoehorned into responding in, in a way I don't want to. It's a problem, I think. You know? Is it a mistake to allow the answer to be other in a survey? Does that kind of ruin the data? Or is it is it better almost always to have like specific answers that are you know a specific answer space? Now, there is disagreement on that subject. So I will just tell you my opinion on the issue with not the correct opinion. It's just mine. And I'll just go ahead and tell you my opinion so that people who disagree can have fun with that. But when you give someone an other answer, or I neither agree nor disagree answer, or I'm not sure answer, any of those things that allow them or don't know that allow them to sort of drop out of having an opinion, that tends to suck up responses like a black hole because everyone feels that their attitude is more nuanced, or many people do, than the categories that are provided and that don't know other, I'm not sure, all those type of responses are pretty useless analytically. Because if um, if I give you a question on a political issue, let's say, for example, abortion or gun control, something, something that's a controversial, hot topic, political issue, and you answer other, that's pretty much useless in a quantitative or statistical analysis, because I don't know if you're other because you're way more liberal on these issues than any of the responses we provided or way more conservative than all the responses provided or simply have some sort of belief that just falls out of the stratosphere that doesn't fit any category. Therefore, you are not part of the analysis. So what I have found over time, my opinion on the issue is if I ask you if you believe in UFOs and I give you strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree, you might be saying to yourself, I don't like that because I think there might be something to UFOs, but I'm also very skeptical. I think when you're presented with those choices, you're going to think about it and decide whether you disagree more or agree more. And I think that is a meaningful exercise. Others would disagree. You know, in a question like that, I, yeah, I've, I've had stuff like that. I guess, you know, you just, I would end up giving milk toast answers if I'm forced into a channel where I don't want to be. It's like, well, I have no opinion that. That's the problem. That's the problem is that is, and not only that, but um, when you give, when you have that sort of middle range, milk toast, don't know other answer, a lot of times also when someone's embarrassed about their answer or feels judged their answer, that's where they're going to jump to. So again, there's a host of other interesting issues that, are, that we could talk about for hours that interest me and would bore a lot of other people. But there's another problem too. If I don't give you an option to say other, you might just get annoyed and skip the question altogether. That's also an issue. So these are all things that people who are constructing a survey need to think carefully about. That um, in many situations in survey construction, there are issues where it's not so much as there a right or wrong answer. Rather, the way that you construct the question is going to have consequences and be aware of those consequences. Is there a survey school out there or like a body of work that people that want to get into the business should study? Well, there are there are survey construction books across the disciplines that I am a trained sociologist. And as part of my training, I learned about the construction of surveys and the analysis of surveys. Political science has similar has similar books. So it's it's not as if there is one manual that I'm aware of that is sort of a general all-purpose survey construction manual. I'm sure those exist in fields such as marketing, but I don't have a specific recommendation.
I guess last insider question, I guess, and, you know, I'll let you go, Charlie. Um, You know, some surveys, if I feel like no one's going to look at it, then I'm like, eh, I'll just put garbage in it or not even answer it because there's no point. I know no one's going to look at it or I think no one's going to look at it. Is that ever a, a large factor or a factor? Well, obviously, that's a factor that I, I have no way of knowing when you take one of my anonymous surveys, if you didn't lie all the way through or just check garbage. There are things that when we're concerned about that, me, we meaning not just myself and my co-authors in particular, but survey researchers can do to try to look for that. One way we try to do that is we might ask you the same or a very similar question at the front and the back of the survey. And if you agree with gun control at the beginning and strongly disagree at the end, we're probably got a garbage response. So there are different things that we can do. We sometimes can, we'll sometimes reverse the order of categories so that for some questions, strongly agree is at the top, for others, strongly agree is at the bottom. And we can see if people just seem to be checking the first box, no matter what. So there's different tests that we can do on, on our end to try to see if we're getting quality data. But the other thing too is when we're surveying and when good survey firms are doing this, they're surveying thousands of people. And amongst those thousands of people, there's going to be some people who are saying, I'm going to show these survey survey people and I'm going to lie through the whole thing. Or I'm going to show these survey people and I'm going to pretend like I'm a liberal or pretend like I'm a conservative or I'm just going to check these boxes. Those are going to be in. But when you do an analysis with hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of cases, that noise is going to be washed away by any signal that you, if that makes any sense, that uh, there will be some cases in there where there's been lying or garbage or people have skipped a bunch of question. But if there is a true strong effect of race on some variable, gender on some variable, that is going to wash away those random cases where there's garbage. Okay. Well, very good, Chris. What's the best place for people to find out more, maybe participate in some of the surveys or at least see the data? Where can they go? They should just do a Google search or a, a whatever search engine for the Chapman University Survey of American Fears. And first link that will appear will be, will take them directly to the official website for that survey where they can see, always see the latest findings. We always have up there comparisons of the last several waves so people can see if their particular fear of interest has been growing. People can download the survey, download the questionnaire. So there's a lot of information about the survey. There. Okay. Any other ways for people to follow you or is that really the best way? Uh, I would say that they, if they have an interest in the big religion survey project we've been discussing on and off throughout this, they should go to thearda.com, T-H-E-A-R-D-A.com. We literally have thousands of surveys related to religion on that site that people can look at. They can download themselves, do some simple analyses online. You can even put in your address and see a religious break and demographic breakdown of your neighborhood. So I would recommend them all. Other than that, just the usual method. Search for my name on Amazon. You'll find my books, um, that sort of. Okay, very good. Well, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a really interesting call. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 